When the Soviet Union announced the launch of the tiny Sputnik satellite on October 4th, 1957, the United States held its collective breath and pondered the larger meaning of its die-hard political adversary actually possessing the technical means to send an atomic weapon around the globe to strike American soil. The silly beeping of that small sphere flying over North America every 90 minutes belied the existential shock of knowing we had nothing of the sort that was anywhere near this level of success. Many Americans today still remember looking up in the night sky and seeing that single white star moving across the zenith with improbable velocity. And it was a Russian star, a communist star, and its very existence mocked America to its core. Although the Russians, German rocket scientists, were now officially ahead of our German rocket scientists, the American program, in stark contrast to the Soviets, made a point of publicly announcing and having the press on site for every attempt to put a satellite into orbit. This kind of openness carried high risk of embarrassment, as proven by the first two failures of the Vanguard program. But it also proved we were serious enough and confident enough in our eventual success that the public relations payoff was well worth the risk. NASA's Project Mercury was announced only three days after Sputnik's launch, underlining the high risk and potentially high payoff of the ensuing space race with the Soviet Union. NASA's initial focus on simply getting American astronauts into space shifted less than two years later into studying the feasibility of actually sending men to the moon. Concept development for Project Apollo was announced to the aerospace industry in July of 1960. And a year later, President Kennedy made his dramatic speech to Congress. Of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Setting the goal of putting Americans onto the moon and bringing them safely back before the decade was out. The moon. How really to get there and back? What conditions would the astronauts encounter on the quarter million mile journey to our orbiting neighbor? More importantly, how could the astronauts possibly train to fly with precision their ungainly lander in the completely alien environment of the airless moon and only one sixth of the Earth's gravity? As more questions were asked, more problems were uncovered. Fortunately, NASA nurtured some of the greatest minds in engineering and science to answer those questions. Towering over 200 feet above the southwest corner of the NASA Langley facility in Hampton, Virginia, NASA's once decommissioned Lunar Lander Research Facility is being put to use again as a dynamic test bed for the next generation of American spacecraft. This huge structure grew from the fertile imagination and brilliant engineering mind of W. Hewitt Phillips, chief of NASA Langley's Stability and Control Group when he and a small group of engineers began in 1963 to come up with a solution for understanding and training for a rocket-powered landing 
in a lunar gravity field that was a mere one-sixth of the Earth's. For this critical phase of the Apollo program, Phillips fabricated the first model of the Lunar Lander Research Facility using an Erector Set model kit in his home workshop. The concept was approved at a cost of $3.5 million, and work began immediately on full-scale design and construction. The system became operational in 1965. Within an amazing complex series of girders, trusses, and a movable bridge crane, the 400 by 230 foot ground footprint underneath the gantry provided the Apollo astronauts a huge three-dimensional space in which they could practice the final 150 feet of their planned lunar landings. The Lunar Excursion Module Simulator was a manned rocket-powered vehicle used to familiarize the Apollo astronauts with the handling characteristics of a lunar landing type vehicle. The gantry provided the astronauts with a much richer simulation environment than was available with a static unit inside a conventional laboratory. In addition to providing motion cues along all three axes of roll, pitch, and yaw, it also allowed for an actual vertical descent to a simulated lunar surface with the astronauts controlling their descent rate with a small rocket engine, reinforcing both the aural and vestibular cues they would be experiencing during the real lunar descent. Attesting to the engineering and planning skill that went into development of the Lunar Lander Research Facility, astronaut Neil Armstrong, when asked what it was like to land on the moon, replied, quote, like Langley, end quote. That iconic statement, like Langley, speaks volumes about the incredible talent that could imagine a problem, understand it, and visualize a solution, and then translate all of it into physical reality and computer-controlled reactions that correctly mirrored an unproven reality a quarter million miles away. With the demise of the Apollo program in the early 1970s, there was no immediate need for either the gantry or the simulation controls for any new space systems. However, recognizing the usefulness of the massive 3D space within its structure, NASA, in 1974, repurposed the gantry as the Impact Dynamics Research Facility. As the name implies, the structure was used to hoist airplanes to varying heights and attitudes, at which point they were dropped to study the structural dynamics of a crash. After nearly 30 years of crash tests, funding for the facility dried up, and NASA made plans for decommissioning and demolition. But in 2003, a revived NASA crew vehicle program, Constellation, and potential Mars missions necessitated reconfiguring the venerable structure again into a landing impact research facility, reverting to many of the functions and modes of the original Apollo research. Of particular interest was providing a pool suitable for water landing tests of the Constellation and other commercial crew vehicles, recalling the dramatic early days of America's manned space programs. Today, the complex is in high demand from NASA and various commercial companies who see the need for future development of aeronautical and space exploration systems to take humans far into the cosmos.